We are in a series of lessons on Sunday night on attitude. And we, we've we looked at a couple. We'll look at one more next week. But I want us to look tonight at our attitude towards others. We looked at attitudes towards life ex- ex- experiences or life itself. We talked about rejoicing. Tonight, I want us to, to look at the attitude of, of love, loving others. There was a young girl that uh, was engaged to a young man. The young man fell sick, just really sick. was in the hospital for a period of time and was at home. She was with him the whole time. She was there nursing him, trying to nurse him back to health. And just it had been a long extended period of time. And someone asked her father, said, what in the world is keeping her going? And the father said she is simply driven by love love for him and wanting him to get well and so she is taking care of him love is is an emotion is a feeling but love is that which desires the best and is defined in many ways but defined i think the best way is that which is wanting what is best for another when we love someone that's what we want we want what is best for them we want to do what's best for them. We want to act the way that's best for them. We want to be with them, but we want what is best for them. And as we think about that, we have to think about, well, this is the attitude that we're supposed to have towards others. And as we've been doing, the first thing we need to understand is God's call us to love one another. The Bible talks about in John chapter 13, Jesus says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. He called us. To do that. In Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9, Paul said concerning brotherly love, you have need that I write unto you. In other words, you're already doing it. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews 13, verse 1 says, Let brotherly love continue. The, the principle, on and on we could go, but the principle that the Bible teaches is to love one another. And while we get to Sometimes we get so hooked up on what type of love should we have? Should we have the phileo love? Should we have the the storge love? Should we have the agape love? Well, let's just suffice it from a standpoint, not of the Greek, but let's suffice it from the standpoint of the English. Love one another. Attitude we should have. This is what God expects of us. This is what God wants of us. This is what God wants from us. And yet, let's be honest. It's sometimes difficult. God might want it. And we understand where to do it. But sometimes it's difficult. And there's various reasons for that. First of all, we don't all think the same way. We don't all have the same perspective. We don't all look, if you will, at the world through the same glasses. All different. We have different opinions. We have different ideas and ideals. We think differently. We have different philosophies. We have different backgrounds that have influenced us and influenced our thinking to the point in which we understand God tells us love one another. But we still realize that is the most difficult thing in the world to do, to to truly love one another like God would have us to love one another. In many ways, we're like a story I, I read many years ago about a zoo, and actually the zoo was in Russia. And folks went to the zoo, and they were quite amazed because in one cage was a lion and a lamb. And the the people just came that day, and they were just astonished. How in the world? And so finally someone found a zoo, one of the zookeepers and said, how did that lamb stay in that cage? In that, uh, Cage with the lion. And, and the zookeeper says, Well, said it's quite easy. Said we just change lambs every day. <laughs> That's somehow the way we get along sometimes. And we are different. It's not that we're different. God understands we're different. God didn't say, you know, love only the ones that love you. Love only the ones that like you. Love only the ones that have the same philosophies you do. Love only the ones that have the same thinking you do. He said, love one another. Want what is best. Do what is best for 
one another. That's the expectation that God has of us. Well, having understood the expectation, even though we see the difficulties of it, and we see the different sides of it, we have to, to look then at how, what kind of love do we have? And you've heard sermons. I've preached no telling how many sermons on love. You've heard no telling how many sermons. So we still have to ask ourselves, as we're doing with these attitudes, knowing we need these attitudes because God tells us, we have to ask ourselves, how do we go about developing that attitude? And I think probably one of the most beautiful pictures is to look at Ephesians 5. If you have your Bibles, you might want to turn to Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, talk about Christ loving the church. So, well, preacher, these are these are verses where Paul uses the analogy of the husband and the wife. As he uses that analogy of the husband and the wife, he uses that analogy to talk about Christ and the church. Yes, how true. But have we ever thought about how Christ loves the church is the same way that we're to love the church? Now I ask you this question, who's the church? We are, right? So it makes sense that if we're to love as Jesus loved, that if we're to, as John said in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, that we're to walk even as he walked, that thus we're to love one another, that we ought to love one another, the church, just as Christ loved the church. Well, how does he do that? Well, Paul says husbands, wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and he gave himself for it. Love and love for one another, first of all, at times is sacrificial. What do we mean that? What do we mean at times? Well, there are times in which we have to sacrifice. It may be our time. It may be from the standpoint of we may have to go somewhere with them and thus use our time, or we may have to sit with them and listen and spend time with them. It may be sacrificed from the standpoint of money. We may need to help them financially if they're in a, a tough spot. It may be from the standpoint of just giving of ourselves to them. You know, when you think about when Paul was talking about giving in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 5, he says, this they did not as we hoped, but they first gave themselves. But it's interesting what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. Paul talks about how that he helped the brethren with all lowliness, meekness. He helped them. That he was willing, he even told the church at Philippi, that he was willing to give himself as a drink offering for them. And said, he says that, that if he was offered upon the sacrifice and service of their faith, he rejoiced. That he was able to sacrifice for others. Sometimes our love is if you don't bother me, if you don't infringe upon me, if it doesn't cost me anything. Sort of like one guy said one time he was introducing a speaker. He said, he said, there's nothing I wouldn't do for him, and I've done that for 40 years. Nothing. Love sacrifices at times. Love goes out of its way. Jesus, Paul said, Christ also loved, him church, loved, himself, loved the church rather, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it. We think of sanctify, we think of the idea of saint, right? We think of the idea of religious holiness. But the word sanctify is the idea of set apart. It's special. It's, it, it's special. It's not, if you will, something that, that is just happens. Oh, I say it this way in Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Don't be a hypocrite in your love. You see, Jim just led us in a beautiful song, love one another. Now, here's the question. Do we have each other set aside enough that we're willing to sacrifice self, that our feelings for others are selfless enough that we're willing to say, you know, what can I do to help you? 
Have you set apart? Have you sanctified your brother and sister in Christ? Set them apart and said, I love them, whatever it takes. There was a mother that was riding on a train. And it was cold. It was bitterly cold. Matter of fact, there was a, a virtual blizzard outside. And she told the conductor, she told him, she said, I get off at such and such stop. You tell me. And every little bit, she would remind him, hey, don't forget me. He would say, okay, okay. And finally, it came time for her to get off, her stop. And he went back there to find her, and she was not there. He asked the other people around, sitting around her, where's the young lady that was sitting here with the baby in her arms? Said, well, she got off at the last stop. And he said, well, that wasn't her stop. And if she got off there, there's no one there. She got off to her death. Sure enough, there was a search party that went back, and they found her. She had frozen to death, sadly. The baby was warm because she had taken off almost all of her clothes and wrapped that baby up in it to help keep that baby safe. You might say, well, that's a mother's love. Jesus loved the church enough that he sanctified it, set it apart. It was special. It meant something to him. The church was, was special to him. Our brethren special to us, mean something to us. But then there, Jesus' love, according to what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5, it, it's supportive. What does he say in verse 29? For no one ever yet hated himself, but nurse and cherish. The idea is, is that He's going to take care of himself, but yes, but he's going to take care of others. He supports others. Now, once again, that support sometimes is a good ear. Sometimes it's a listening on the telephone. Sometimes it's a putting your arm around. Sometimes it's the presence at a funeral or, or at the hospital. Sometimes it's just being there or knowing or letting the individual know that you can be there. Letting the individual realize and see the fact that you can be there for them. That support sometimes comes from the standpoint of encouragement. It is that phone call. It is that visit. It is that card that's sent in the mail. It is those words of encouragement. Let's consider one another and provoke to love and good works. That's the addition that the Hebrew writer gave us in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Verse 5, then it's not forsaken to assembly ourselves together as a matter of some is, exhorting one another. Oh, do you like that idea? And we come to church, yes, to worship God, but in our worship of God, we're exhorting, we're encouraging one another, we're giving one another. The idea of encouraging, go back to the, to the root of the word, is the idea of giving heart. Cardia, giving the heart to someone. You're giving them heart. You're lifting them up, supporting them. And sometimes that support comes not only from the standpoint of, of telling them, but just happen to be there. Then Jesus' love, verse 29 is again, Ephesians 5 is sincere. Not with hypocrisy. While Paul would write to abhor what is evil and cling to what is good, he would remind us that we're to be kindly affection one to another. 12 and verse 10. There would be individuals that truly that we, we are sincere in our love. It's not fake. You've seen people. You've seen people walk up to people, people butter up people. You've seen those folks. You've probably been around those folks. You may, you may even be one of those folks. I don't think so. But you realize that their, their concern is fake. 
their love is fake. They're they're wanting something out of the relationship. They're wanting to, to gain something that they don't have. Jesus didn't give himself to the church just because he wanted something out of it. Jesus' love for the church was such that it was sincere. It meant something because the church meant something to him. So love is sincere. Well, having said all that, then we come to the third point. And it's the attitude that God expects. He expects us to love one another. He expects us to have that love. Great, great. Can you put in practical terms, and that's what we've been doing this series, third point, put in practical terms how we can go about being individuals that truly exhibit that love for one another, that, that sacrificial, sincere love that is sanctified. Can, can, we really, can we really show that off? And the answer is yes. How? I'm going to give you three answers. I'll start with letter A. I'll be able to remember these when we walk out. If I test you tonight when you walk out, you can pass. Just remember that all day. That's all you have to do. No. But what's the first one? Awareness. Awareness. Being aware of what's going on in people's lives, but not just people's lives, but what they need. One of the, the interesting thoughts was is that when Paul had Timothy circumcised, remember that? Go back and study that. Do you remember why he had him circumcised? Was it because it was part of the law? Nope. It was because of the people that he was going to get be in contact with. And he thought that being in contact with these people would be such that, that this impact would be what was needed. See, he was aware of what was going on with people. Preacher, does that mean I got to have surgery? You know, no. Do I have to have hip surgery to, to be able to sympathize with those that that need a hip replacement or knee surgery to sympathize with those that need knee replacement? No. I need to be aware. I need to be aware of who's who and what's what and what's going on. Not a gossip. Go back to 1 Corinthians 13 where Paul talks about love. Not a gossip. But aware of people and their feelings and their opinions and their ideas. I had the the task Wednesday night of, of preaching at Maple Hill on the subject of the, the thing for the summer is rooted in Christ. And my theme was rooted in Christ, how to remain rooted in Christ when the government questions or goes against or opposes your faith. So I explained to them, I started telling them, I said, I'm not going to talk Democrat. I'm not going to talk Republican. My daddy told me, and I've told y'all before, my daddy told me when I started preaching, there are three things that make people mad when you talk about. It. Number one is religion. You're going to talk about that. Number two is money. And number three is politics. And the advice my father gave me, he said, number one, you got to preach religion. I mean, that's what you are, a gospel preacher. And you're going to have to preach on money every once in a while because people got to give. And sometimes they got to be encouraged to give. Stay away from politics because that'll make people mad. Yes, sir. I've, I've held up on that one pretty good. And then they asked me to come Wednesday night and spoke. So here's what I did. I spoke on Daniel. <laughs> But we have to understand, you say, well, what does that have to do with awareness? Awareness of where people are in their thinking, their philosophy. In the church, we have Democrats, we have Republicans, we have independents. We have folks that say, I'm not voting. I got it. I understand. I am what I am. Suzanne is what she is. We are the same. We talk about what, what we're going to vote for, and then we go vote and do what we want to. So I don't know who she votes for because she goes in there and she votes for who she wants to, and I vote for who I want to. We do vote the same, or wouldn't be any sense in going, really. But in the church, there's Democrat and Republican. That means that probably I don't agree with all of you. But that's not a reason to make that an issue. 
It's not a reason to stand up here and preach anything other than the Bible. But I'm aware, as you are too. We need to be aware of people's feelings. That's what Paul did with regards to, as we said, circumcision of, of Timothy. It's what Paul was talking about. If you go back and read Romans chapter 14 and, and Romans 15, especially one of the things you find out is that Paul deals with the idea of, of being aware of the feelings of others. One of the hardest jobs in the world is being an elder in the church. You know why? Because you can't please everybody. You can't. You cannot please. Elders cannot please everybody. I usually, when a man is installed as an elder in the congregation where I am, I walk up to him and say, I'm sorry. Love you, but I'm sorry. Because you can't please everybody. And somebody's going to get mad. You see, somebody's probably upset. I'm not talking about fighting mad, but somebody's probably upset at the temperature tonight in this building. Some of you got on sweaters. Some of you say, it's hot. I had one lady once, I was associate minister, so that narrows down where I was. I was associate minister, she walked out, she said, I'm not coming back again. Luckily, I said, here's a preacher right here. She said, I'm not coming back. He said, why not? It's too cold in here. Interesting. Because three people walked out and said they were hot. You can't please everybody. But you can have an awareness. And people need to be assured that they express that awareness. While Paul would talk about being aware of folks, he says to be patient with them in Ephesians chapter 4, doesn't he? When he talks about that endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, you remember that? What does it say in verse 2? He says we're to be patient with people. We're to be long-suffering. That our speech in that same chapter, in that speech, he says, is to be seasoned with salt. Our, our speech is that of grace, seasoned with salt. You see, our awareness of folks is that we're aware of what's going on, we're aware of their emotions, and we're aware of their feelings. So we're aware of their physical or their philosophies, we're aware of where they are, we're aware of their feelings, we're aware of their sensitivities. We're aware of their needs. Preacher, how can I be aware of their needs? Well, sometimes folks won't tell you. And, and when they won't, they won't. And that's fine because I believe we have to respect people's power. Because I want you to respect mine. But at the same point in time, too, here's the key. Here's the key to awareness. It's one word. Got a few letters in it, but it's simple. It's called communication. Communication. Brothers and sisters of Christ need to communicate. Not in an ugly way, not in a haughty way, but in a kind, loving way, we need to communicate. How do we love one another? By an awareness of people individually, their philosophies, where they stand, their sensitivity. Secondly, we love others. How do we do that? By being available. Go through sometime in your study of the Bible, tomorrow, and, and, and I'm talking about just a summary now. I'm not talking about, you know, an in-depth study. But go through Paul's writings and notice the people that are involved in Paul's writings. I mean, there's a lot of people that's mentioned, right? There, there, there's people that, that will go to Romans 16. You just, you know, there's name after name after name. And they meant something to Paul. And I'm sure Paul meant something to them. He was available. Paul gives a couple of examples. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 6, Paul talks about God, who comforts those that are cast down, comforts us with the coming of Titus, an individual. He says, God has comforted me through an individual. That individual had to be what? Available to come to comfort me. Second example is that of a man 
by Onesiphorus. You may call him Onesiphorus. Which one is it? I have looked and looked and looked, and it's either one. I call him Onesiphorus. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul talks about a man, this man by the name of Onesiphorus. And he talks about, Lord, have mercy upon the house of Onesiphorus, for he all refreshed me, not being ashamed of my chains. As we put the picture together, it seems like that Paul being in prison, Onesiphorus comes and comforts him. Now, you could look at others. You could look at Epaphroditus, and you could look at the fact that he brought evidently some, some financial help and maybe possibly some other benevolent help to Paul while he was in jail. But there was an availability. Hey, I need help. Yeah, good. You know, James talked about that with regards to faith. As he talks about, you see your brother has a need, and you do what? You say, you go, go your way, be filled. And James says, you do nothing. And you say, well, preacher, that, that's, that's a whole different subject. Yes, but the principle, principle, the idea is interesting. You see, we have to ask ourselves, are we available for people? Do we really care enough to be available for them? And what's going on in their life? Love is available. Love, thirdly, acts. And I just put the word action. Probably should have put the word acts. But it's action. Love does, just doesn't say, as we put our arm around, hey, I love you. It shows itself. It shows itself distinctively. It shows itself and exhibits itself through acts. Through doing for others. We think about the idea of doing things for others. We see a lot of folks and a lot of things in the Bible. The, the story of marriage is a good one. When you think about the fact that he takes time, he leaves money, so therefore he spends his money. He acts in such a way as to not look at that man as somebody that is suspicious, but to look at him as someone that has a need. And so he spends his time, he stops, he helps him, he picks him up, he carries him to an inn, and he leaves money when he can stay no longer, and says, if there's any other debt, I'll take care of it when I come back. Well, preacher, I don't have a lot of extra money. I understand that. It's not all about money about time. It's about being there. It's about person. We need to ask ourselves sometimes, how would I feel if I were in the situation they're in? What would I want done to me? And so Paul reminds us in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, by love, we're to serve one another. Now, therein lies an interesting concept, which I'm afraid that our society is getting away from because the word serve connotates the idea of slavery, and that connotates a bad thing. But from a biblical standpoint, people of that day and age understood it. And it's the idea of just simply say, okay, how can I help you? How can I be of assistance to you? And so when Jesus said, by love, serve one another, he's saying, do what you can for your brother. Why? Because you want what is best for him or for her, for brother or sister. We're using brother from a generic standpoint. And so... The attitude of love needs to be practiced. Boy was told by his mother, she said, I'm busy, I'm cleaning up dishes. It was Saturday evening. She said, Would you polish my shoes for me for church tomorrow? He said, Absolutely. He went in, grabbed her shoes, he polished them, did a fantastic job. And when he got through, she gave him a dollar. Oh, you did a fantastic job. Here's a dollar. 
He didn't say anything. Sunday morning, she's running around. She's cooked breakfast. They're running around trying to, to get ready for church. She starts to put on her shoes. And she starts to put on one, and she can't get her foot in it. What in the world? And so she takes her foot out. She reaches in the shoe, and there's that dollar. And there's a note from that little boy that says, I've done it for love. That's the attitude we have towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's best summed up, I think, by many different verses, but this one means more to me. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. Endures all things. First Corinthians 13 and verse 7. Now I want us to, to just stop for just a second. This is the conclusion, but I still want us to stop. And I want us to look at this verse. And I want us to think about what Paul says. He says, love bears all things. Which means sometimes we're not going to see eye to eye. Which means sometimes we're not going to see things the way that uh, that everybody else sees them. Love bears up under the scrutiny of other individuals and even what they may say and even how they may act. You can have a dog that you love dearly. And if that dog is sick, if that dog doesn't feel well, and if you approach it in a wrong way, that dog still may snap at you. But you still love the dog. Because here's the thing you say, poor thing, you're sick, aren't you? And then, and that's right. That's right. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm saying it's right. We need to do that with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Love bears all things. It believes all things. It believes what is good and what is best. We are often quick to believe about brother or sister A or B the bad things. And we do it a lot of times without checking to see what's going on in their life. It gets us back to the idea of awareness and communication. Believes all things. Hopes. Hopes for the very best. We may sometimes not see eye to eye. We may even grow angry with them. But we settle that anger. Why? Because we're hoping for the best. It endures all things. We may come up a little short at times. We may come up a little hurt at times. We may come up uh, at times and, and have our feelings hurt themselves. We may feel shorted in that we've done more for them than they've done for us. And that's not fair. The attitude that God says is to love one another. This evening, as we... So, and as many of you, when you walk out, will say, Preacher, I, you know, I have love for one another. I know. But you know what? I have found through life, I have found through life that every once in a while I use a hoe, I use a shovel, I'll use some sort of, I've got two or three different kinds of clippers, and I'll use them. Every once in a while they need a little sharpening. They're still quite usable, but they need a little sharpening. Every once in a while, preachers that just have to sit back and say, you know, we just need to sharpen up a little bit. We're doing fine. Let's just sharpen up and get a little bit sharper on it. Love one another. May God bless us as we go towards that end. If you have need of the Lord's invitation this evening, won't you come? All together we stand and sing.